welcome to lecture series on advanced geotechnical engineering and we are in module 4 and discussing about the stress strain relationships and shear strength of soils and in the previous lecture we introduced ourselves to how to you know draw the stress paths for different conditions. Now in this lecture we further you know discuss on the stress paths in PQ space and then uh, afterwards we introduce ourselves to different stress strain behavior of uh, uh, materials the stress strain behavior of different materials and thereafter we will try to introduce ourselves to more column failure criteria and thereafter we will discuss about its uh, limitations and correlations with the PQ space. So in this particular lecture we will be discussing about the further discussion on the uh, stress paths in PQ space. Then we will introduce ourselves to stress strain behavior of different materials and thereafter we introduce ourselves to more column failure criteria. So as we have discussed in the previous lecture you know we have considered you know an example where the hydrostatic stress conditions prevail. The hydrostatic stress conditions means sigma v is equal to sigma h is equal to 0. But now let us consider uh, we have uh, a sample uh, which is not having identical uh, uh, stresses in vertical and horizontal direction. That means that sigma v is not equal to sigma h is equal to 0 or we can uh, say that you know the sample which has been taken has been uh, reconsolidated uh, such a way that you know to represent the initial uh, in-situ stress conditions. So in this particular uh, slide a sample which is actually shown with the sigma v vertical on the acting vertically and sigma h acting horizontally. So the initial condition here is that sigma v is not equal to sigma h not equal to 0 and the this is called as the non hydrostatic compression. So we are actually taking that initially we have the non hydrostatic compression then q0 is equal to sigma v minus sigma h by 2 that we have defined earlier and P0 is equal to sigma V plus sigma H by 2. So during loading or unloading we have a tendency of increasing delta sigma V and by keeping delta sigma H constant or by you know you can actually vary you know vertical, vertical increased vertical stresses or horizontal stresses. Now we are actually required to you know, you know develop a stress path for a axial compression where initially the sample is in non hydrostatic compression that means that sigma v is not equal to sigma h and which is also not equal to 0. So the final coordinates of the stress path A you know are you can say that qf is equal to q0 sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma h by 2. So here we have actually increased sigma v and here also we increased in the pf nothing but sigma v plus sigma h by 2 plus delta sigma v by 2. So if you see that the delta q from the initial conditions they both are actually increased by about delta sigma v by 2 and delta sigma h by 2. So the stress path for this condition is something like this when you have the condition where we, we do not have you know non hydrostatic compression previously when we have the hydrostatic compression we are actually on the p axis but now because of the uh, prevalence of the non hydrostatic compression uh, we have uh, you know a certain uh, ordinate here and from there for the path a is that sigma delta sigma h is equal to 0 and uh, you know if you increase the delta sigma v then you know you actually have this condition here so uh, with with uh, uh, here what we have done is that delta sigma h is equal to 0 and delta x sigma h is equal to 0. So because of that you know we have increased delta sigma v in both the directions. So we have qf and pf they are the final uh, coordinates of uh, uh, you know the stress path A and with that uh, you know we actually have got the you know the inclination of the stress path is also because these both are same the delta q by delta p the slope of this line which actually comes to 1 that means that. Uh, the stress path actually you know A is inclined at 45 degrees. So the stress path A is inclined at 45 degrees. Now for stress path D 
uh, wherein the delta sigma v decreases while delta sigma h increases that means that you can see here such path d. So, such, such path d where delta sigma v decreases and delta sigma h increases. Suppose if you say that uh, uh, for delta sigma v decreases and delta sigma h is equal to 0 then this test path c is actually in this direction and this is also inclined at 45 degrees and uh, you know this uh, you know is can be deduced very easily and similarly by using the same concepts what we have discussed uh, you know when we have got uh, delta sigma v increases and delta sigma g uh, sigma h decreases then we have a stress path uh, in this direction. So, let us uh, try to derive uh, you know what is the stress path uh, for uh, d that is in this condition uh, we have delta sigma v decreases and delta sigma h increases. So, for the stress path d uh, the condition what we have is that uh, delta sigma v decreases while delta sigma h increases. So, the delta sigma h increases that is uh, the condition which we are having here. So, initially sigma v is not equal to sigma h is equal to 0. So, initial conditions are that p naught uh, is equal to sigma v uh, q naught is equal to uh, sigma v minus sigma h by 2 and p naught is equal to sigma v plus sigma h by 2 and the final coordinates of the path d uh, we, we can look into it here the delta sigma v is decreasing. So, uh, we can write the final coordinates of the point d as q f is equal to one of the coordinates is equal to q f is equal to sigma v minus delta sigma v minus sigma h plus delta sigma h because this is positive because delta sigma h is increasing here divided by 2 and similarly p f is equal to sigma v minus delta sigma v because delta sigma v is decreasing and delta sigma h is increasing. So, sigma h plus uh, delta sigma h by 2 by simplifying this uh, we get uh, you know q f minus q naught if you take that is delta q which is nothing but minus delta sigma v by 2 and minus delta sigma h by 2 and delta p is equal to minus delta sigma v by 2 plus delta sigma h by 2. So, the actual slope we are actually not defining the delta q by delta p is the slope of this stress path line d, but the actual slope of this stress path d depends on the relative magnitudes of delta sigma v and delta sigma h, but in general it trends uh, it uh, uh, trends downward and out. So, the actual slope of the, the stress path d depends on the relative magnitudes of delta sigma v and delta sigma h, but in general uh, it is actually uh, you know trending downward and out. So, what we have done is that in this particular example in continuation of our previous example where hydrostatic uh, stress conditions are there, there we have uh, drawn the stress paths a, b, c, d and similar to this. Uh, what we have done is that when initially we have say initially non hydrostatic compression conditions then we have deduced and derived here stress path A and stress path D and we have said that the stress path D the inclination depends upon the relative magnitudes of delta sigma V and delta sigma H and uh, so in the similar lines uh, uh, you know we can deduce uh, the stress paths for B and C the procedure is same first is that getting the initial coordinates that is Q naught and P naught. And then uh, depending upon the condition we have, we have to get the, the final coordinates of uh, the stress path. Then uh, we have to get the delta q and delta uh, p which is nothing but delta q is nothing but uh, q f minus uh, q naught and delta f delta p is nothing but uh, uh, you know p f minus uh, p naught and with that uh, we will be able to get the uh, by delta q by delta p we will be able to get the slope of the stress path. And, uh, and we also can draw the stress paths at different uh, you know uh, on the uh, q p space. Now, one more uh, you know information here is that the path a which is actually here also represents because it is initially uh, you know uh, you know non hydrostatic stress conditions. So, the initial in situ stress conditions uh, in a for a sample when it uh, when we have uh, you know uh, sigma v not equal to sigma h and this represents the initial in situ uh, stress conditions. So, path A also represents the reconsolidation of soil sample under K naught conditions. So, this path A uh, this is also uh, indicates the reconsolidation of a soil sample under K naught condition when we do because under K naught condition means uh, we, we know we do not have the identical stresses and sigma V for example, for a normally consolidated soil we have got uh, uh, you know sigma H is equal to K naught uh, sigma V 
and where k naught is equal to it can be for 0 0.5. So in that case, you know, it it will actually represent the path A, also represent the reconsolidation of soil sample under k naught conditions. So we will try to you know look into for the different you know stress ratios. It is convenient to express this in the in the form of stress ratios, and sigma h by sigma v. A sigma h is nothing but you know vertical stress. Sigma h is nothing but the horizontal stress. Sigma v is nothing but the vertical stress, and you know depends upon like you know. Uh, with the example of stress path starting from zero, where sigma h is equal to sigma v is equal to zero, then you know we have the you know we have written diff, drawn different stress paths here, and uh, the one which is actually here, uh, which is indicates that k is equal to one, that is what actually what we said is that the hydrostatic compression where sigma h is equal to sigma v, where k is equal to one condition. Suppose if you are having a sample uh, under water, then you know that k is equal to one, uh, which is actually uh, along this line. Uh, then you know we have uh, uh, you know the line which is uh, you know when k less than one, uh, k less than one uh, that is for uh, you know uh, where we have got k greater than one, uh, which is actually indicates for the uh, you know over consolidated soil samples and uh, 0.5 to one is actually normally consolidated uh, place and uh, up to maximum 0.8 for normally consolidated soils, but for normally consolidated place this is k naught condition. And where k naught is equal to sigma dash h by sigma dash v, and where in this zone above this p axis or p p dash axis, sigma v is greater than sigma h, and below this p p dash axis, it is sigma v is less than sigma h. So, in case of let us say that over consolidated soil, there can be you know very high you know horizontal stress. Because of the stress locking, which actually can take place because of the past stress history conditions, or when we have got less, let us say the hard crust, and where the soil has been subjected to a very high amount of water consolidation stresses because of the process of drying, and there also it can be possibility that the some stresses can be locked, and when and where the sigma h is actually can be more than sigma v. And we also have you know this particular line, which is the uppermost line, which is actually called as you know KF line, and which is the failure line, which is actually inclined at inclined at a psi, and this this line is actually inclined at an angle beta. So KF is equal to sigma dash HF and by sigma dash VF. So this is nothing but horizontal stress at failure and vertical stress at failure. So the effective horizontal stress at failure, effective vertical stress at failure. So and the samples below here, this also indicates that you know the so when the sample actually has been subjected to extension at failure, then we have the stress path actually extending below the below the p p dash axis, and where with the angle of inclination is negative psi. And this is also K F line under extension condition what we define, and this is the K F condition, K F line under the compression conditions. So the constant constant stress ratios appear as these straight lines on a P Q diagram. So there could be you know these lines could also be stress paths for initial conditions of sigma v is equal to sigma h zero with loading of K equal to a constant sigma h by sigma v, with loadings of k equal to a constant equal sigma h by sigma v. So note that q by p is equal to tan beta. So we can see that when you have got k, you know here the q by p is equal to tan beta, which is nothing but one minus k by one plus k. In terms of k, we can write that. Uh, 1 minus tan beta by 1 plus tan beta in in my in terms of uh, k uh, this expression can be written as 1 minus tan beta by 1 plus tan beta where beta is the slope of the line of constant k where k is less than kf at failure the kf line is indicated by the uh, symbol psi at failure the kf line is indicated by symbol psi in compression or in uh, you know extension but any point when we know uh, at any point when you know p and q and sigma h and sigma v can readily be you know found out graphically. That means that any point once we know the p and q, let us say that at this point, and by drawing 45 degrees line 
uh, from here and here and then you know we can actually find out what is sigma h and sigma v. So uh, with this uh, particular uh, conditions at any point when we know p and q the sigma h and sigma v can readily be found graphically for sigma h is greater than sigma v q is negative and k is actually greater than 1. So sigma h greater than uh, sigma v that is sigma v less than sigma 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 v less than sigma h q is negative and uh, what it indicates that the k will be greater than 1 k will be greater than 1. So this is actually indicates the war consolidated state and this is actually indicates the, the normal consolidated state. So this was the discussion about the you know stress paths uh, for the in the uh, PQ space and the stress paths during sedimentation sampling of uh, normally consolidated clay where K0 is actually less than uh, 1 if you consider. So when, uh, when the, these normally consolidated clay uh, 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 the condition is that when soils are actually deposited in a sedimentary environment like a lake or the, the sea and the sea in the marine environment the lake in the uh, you know uh, in a lacustrine uh, the soils are called lacustrine soils and uh, there is a gradual build up of ore burden stress as additional material is deposited above. So uh, as the deposition actually happens uh, continuously there is a gradual build up of ore burden stress as additional material is deposited uh, above. So if the area of the deposition is relatively large compared to the thickness of the soil deposit then it, it seems that uh, we can reasonably estimate that one dimensional compression takes place. So sigma h by sigma v is equal to k0 which is equal to 0.4 to 0.6 per granular soils and k0 is less than 0.5 and a maximum it can extend up to 0.8 or 0.9. So good average value what we can say is the 0.5. So the stress paths during sedimentation and sampling of normal consolidated clay we are actually intending to uh, draw. So when the soils are actually deposited in a sedimentary environment like a lake or the sea there is a gradual build up of ore burden stress as additional material is being deposited continuously. So if the area of the deposition is actually large compared to the thickness of soil deposit then it seems reasonable to estimate that the compression is going to happen in one dimensional direction. And with that uh, you know sigma h by sigma v is equal to k0 and where k0 is equal to 0.4 to 0.6 uh, uh, basically for granular soils and K0 can be less than 0.5 or maximum will vary up to 0.8 or 0.9 depending upon uh, you know the type of uh, uh, the soil the average is actually about 0.5. Uh, then you know the stress path is actually drawn like this uh, with the Q versus uh, P dash and where uh, you know uh, we have the because of the sedimentation consolidation the stress path actually follows uh, the K0 uh, condition because of the one dimensional so it goes in the along it is it is along the k0 line so it is along the k0 uh, line and uh, then you know if your sampling is there and then then there is a possibility that uh, the stresses will get uh, reduced so you can see that uh, you know this the stress path actually takes uh, 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 this particular direction this is because of the sampling so uh, you know here the, this is actually due to the reduction of the war burden stress upon sampling and uh, stress path actually uh, basically this this uh, path is actually takes place uh, because uh, you know the this is actually reduction of the uh, war burden stress because of the you know whether because we have taken the sample out you know the stress stress in the soil specimen and end, uh, ends up on the k is equal to one axis. So uh, initially we have we are in the you know along the k naught condition then you know we have actually collected the sample and then the war burden stress got relieved. So because of that what will happen is that the path tends to uh, traverse like this and it, it hits the uh, P dash axis uh, that is the you know k is equal to 1 axis this is the k is equal to 1 axis what we have discussed. So instead of sampling uh, sigma v naught decreased due to erosion uh, let us assume that uh, uh, the war burden uh, stress is getting uh, relieved because of the continuous erosion process or uh, some other geologic process. Uh, then uh, an unloading uh, stress path is similar to uh, BC would be followed. So uh, the BC is also like you know unloading uh, stress path BC is also like an unloading uh, stress path and if the vertical stress continue to be removed if the vertical stress is actually continued removed then the path uh, could extend uh, to a point well below the P axis and uh, soil would then uh, be war consolidated. So when the vertical stress is continued to be removed uh, then the soil the, the, st the stress path migrates toward towards the uh, towards the uh, below the p axis 
and uh, the soil would then be uh, you know war consolidated and K0 uh, uh, will be greater than 1. So in this uh, particular slide what we have actually drawn is the stress paths during the sedimentation and the sampling of NC clay. So when you have a continuous uh, sedimentation when it is hap happening and when say no sampling is actually taking place and no erosion is taking place or no other geological process is actually taking place then the stress path actually due to sedimentation process and consolidation process is in this direction. But in case at any point when the, when uh, the sample is actually is collected or in erosion or any some other geological process it has been subjected then there is a reduction in the war burden stress upon sampling or due to the process what we discussed then the stress, the stress state in the soil specimen uh, ends up on the k is equal to 1 axis. Now here in this uh, condition where we have actually given uh, uh, you know the stress paths during drained loading on a normally consolidated clays and sand. So drained loading in the sense that uh, you know during uh, shear uh, we are actually uh, also assuming that the increase in excess pore water pressure is uh, close to 0 that means that there is no changes in the excess pore water pressure and uh, the, the, the sample is allowed to drain. So in this case uh, we have different uh, stress paths which are actually listed here and uh, this is uh, our uh, k axis this is our k axis k is equal to 1 axis and uh, you know this is uh, you know kf line compression and this is our k0 line uh, where we just now discussed about the sedimentation and consolidation and actually happens on k0 conditions and this is the kf line for extension case this this we have this and this we have actually already introduced now let us say that we have got a sample which has been subjected to axial compression and a geotechnical engineering example is that we have a foundation and the loading is actually increasing and the sigma h is constant and sigma v is actually increasing like you know we have two storied building or three storied building the column is subjected to say increased loading. So in that case the element AC is subjected to axial compression. Uh, and uh, the example for this is actually the foundation loading increasing that is indicates for sigma v and the sig with a, with a sigma h constant sigma h constant. So then in that case the stress path actually follows uh, you know uh, uh, for this condition where uh, you have k0 condition that is we have just now derived for uh, you know non hydrostatic uh, compression condition and AC follows at uh, 45 degrees uh, you know this uh, particular uh, you know you know path this is this is the, the stress path. So axial compression for foundation engineering increase increase the where foundation loading increase and sigma h constant and uh, the next example is that LE uh, where the there is a lateral extension is happening that means that uh, you know when active earth pressure conditions actually prevail then when the wall actually moves retaining wall moves away from the backfill the soil element is actually subjected to uh, you know extension lateral extension under a constant uh, you know vertical stress. So this is actually indicated as active earth pressure is decreasing sigma h is decreasing and uh, see, uh, with a sigma v constant. So because uh, you know initially the wall is under uh, elastic equilibrium elastic equilibrium with uh, sigma h and uh, sigma v related with k0 conditions that means that sigma h is equal to k0 sigma v. But what happened is that is the wall when it is actually moving away from the backfill the earth pressure is actually decreasing in the sense that uh, this condition is called active earth pressure condition with a decrease in sigma h at a, with a, at a constant sigma v. So this uh, you know uh, is uh, path is actually followed as LE and this condition is actually indicated here. So this is actually a geological uh, the example in the geotechnical engineering where active earth pressure condition. Then we have another condition called uh, this, this is the stress path which is actually uh, indicates for uh, AE you can see that this is the stress path for AE where axial extension is taking place that means that here uh, we do not have a wall but uh, what is actually happening is that um, we are actually extending uh, we are uh, excavating the soil that means that we have got a certain ground surface and the soil uh, uh, you know the excavation is actually happening and because of that there is a decrease in uh, horizontal uh, <coughs> there because of that there is uh, you know the decrease in the uh, unloading uh, you know uh, uh, and uh, because of that there is a decrease in the uh, sigma v and the sigma h constant. So this condition actually will lead to 
you know the stress path actually like this AE the stress path is actually leading to uh, this particular condition. Then you know when we have this uh, particular example of uh, uh, you know uh, LC which is the stress path for a ge the geotechnical example is that passive earth pressure in, the, in this case wall is actually moving towards the uh, towards the backfill wall is actually moving towards the uh, backfill in, the, in this case the element undergoes horizontal elements undergoes compression where sigma h increases with a sigma v constant. So uh, in this uh, particular uh, case actually what is happening is that uh, you know uh, the lateral compression actually takes place. So the stress path for that is actually indicated as this path line stress path line LC and it actually you know meets the uh, failure line uh, uh, K in the tension that is under extension uh, ultimately and whereas active earth pressure uh, line actually uh, meets uh, ultimately the KF uh, compression line failure line compression when it actually attains the failure and uh, similarly the uh, actual extension line uh, meets also the KF extension line ultimately when it actually attains the failure under uh, you know later like example of unloading or excavation takes place. So uh, where uh, that LC will basically uh, with the lateral compression and uh, you know LE with the lateral extension. Uh, you know the stress paths, stress paths are LE and LC and which is indicates that lateral extension and lateral compression and similarly uh, axial extension and axial compression uh, under initially under uh, non hydrostatic stress conditions are actually plotted here. And uh, here one thing uh, to be noted is that these stress paths are for the drain loadings and hence actually uh, you know uh, for drain loading as there is no change in the excess uh, per water pressures. So hence uh, total stress paths per a given loading uh, is equal to so uh, in case of uh, drain loading these whatever the stress paths we have uh, drawn they are actually valid for both uh, both for uh, uh, you know total stress conditions as well as, well as effective stress conditions. So for drain loading as there is no excess per water pressure during uh, shear loading so the total stress path, total stress paths uh, for a given loading is identical to uh, the effective stress paths. So uh, the total stress paths uh, for a given loading is identical to uh, the effective stress paths. Uh, so PQ diagram uh, allows uh, you know one advantage with uh, total stress paths and uh, effective stress paths for an NC and OC soils. The PQ diagram will allow you to show uh, both total and effective stress paths on the same diagram. Because for normally consolidated soils particularly under, under uh, drained condition as we do not have the variation of uh, uh, you know the uh, poor, uh, excess pore water pressure so both are identical. But in principle the PQ diagram will allow us to show both total and effective stress paths in the same diagram and for drain loading the total stress paths and effective stress paths were identical as the pore water increased by the loading was approximately equal to 0 at all times uh, during shear. So why you know the total stress paths and effective stress paths are identical uh, the point to be noted is that the pore water pressure induced by the loading was approximately equal to 0 at all times during shear. So because it actually is uh, allowed to drain the pore water pressure uh, induced is actually is uh, you know uh, approximately equal to 0 at all times during uh, shear. However during unload, un, undrained loading that means that when the soil sample is not allowed to drain when there is no volume change is actually permitted then the total stress path is not equal to effective stress path because excess pore water pressure develops because of the uh, you know uh, the uh, an undrained conditions. So because of the during undrained loading the total stress path is not equal to effective stress path because excess pore water pressure develops. Now if you look into the total stress path and effective stress path for normally considered clay. Uh, basically for uh, you know uh, axial compression loading uh, for the normally consolidated clay when K0 is actually less than 1. So this is the K0 less than 1 line and this is uh, you know the uh, KF line the failure line and uh, uh, you know in the, in the normal consolidated clay when, uh, when uh, uh, the when we do not allow the you know the drainage to take place under undrained conditions the poor excess pore water pressure develops is positive in nature because uh, uh, you know there is uh, the sample tends to uh, compress. So uh, for actual under compression so actual loading of a normal concert clay the K0 is actually less than 1. So the positive excess pore water pressure uh, delta U develops 
and uh, therefore the effective stress path actually lies to the left of the total stress path because sigma dash is equal to sigma minus delta u where delta u is the excess pore water pressure which is actually developed. So at any point uh, during loading the pore water pressure delta u may be obtained graphically. So uh, when we draw this is the total stress path what we have drawn uh, but when we actually have the uh, you know the effective stress path uh, by considering uh, delta u f at failure. So we can uh, see that uh, this the stress path is actually traversing to the left here the stress path is actually traversing to the left in the, the way it is actually shown here. So uh, at any point during loading so uh, we can actually determine the pore water pressure uh, by the graphically okay we can say that uh, by subtending these ordinates we can we can actually determine what is the pore water pressure uh, depending upon the uh, you know as the uh, loading is actually happening. So uh, this is a case for uh, total stress path and effective stress path for normally concerned clay where this is the total stress path AC is the total stress path and this uh, is the effective stress path because uh, for it this is actually true for normally concerned clay under axial compression. Now let us say that in most practical situations uh, you know in geotechnical engineering there exists a static ground water table always. So that means that there is some uh, initial pore water pressure u naught will always be there acting on the element. So in that case what will actually happen is that when you have got a k naught uh, condition which is k naught less than 1 and uh, the total stress path uh, you know traverses like this uh, this we have discussed by taking the initial uh, pore water pressure into consideration. Uh, then you know we have that uh, uh, you know this T minus U S P is actually is this one and uh, from there uh, you know if it is subjected to uh, the shear loading with uh, without allowing the drainage then the stress path actually traverses like this. So uh, then we are actually driving uh, uh, drawing here or showing here three stress paths one is the total stress path and other one is that T minus U naught SP where U naught is actually is the initial uh, pore water pressure because of the static ground water table uh, and then that is actually called as T minus uh, U naught SP and uh, the other one is the effective stress path. So if you see that the, the three stress paths need to be considered and they are actually effective stress path and T minus T SP and T, T minus U naught SP for axial compression loading. But you know one, one uh, point to be noted is that uh, for uh, static ground water table position uh, U naught actually change does not affect uh, significantly uh, either they on the SP, uh, effective stress path or on the conditions of failure. So hence uh, you know this can be ignored and uh, otherwise you can look into that uh, you know the for static ground water table conditions the U naught actually does not affect uh, you know either the effective stress path or the condition at the failure. Hence, uh, you know this. Uh, uh, this is actually uh, considering the practical situa situation. We are actually uh, have uh, discussed that how that initial existing groundwater table can be taken, and then we have actually drawn three stress paths: the effective stress path and T minus U naught SP and TSP. But the static groundwater table position U naught does not affect either at the either on either the ESP or the uh, you know condition at failure. Um, <coughs> So now after having seen for normally consolidated uh, see the soil then let us look into for how it can be for over consolidated clay total stress pass and effective stress pass for over consolidated clay where uh, we have the K naught greater than 1 condition the K naught actually greater than 1 condition. So the sample is uh, you know already where sigma h is greater than sigma v where actually is the K naught is actually greater than uh, 1 condition. So if the clay is uh, over consolidated basically what will happen is that the negative per initially there will be a some positive per water pressure and the, the clay the dense clay or a stiff clay uh, tends to uh, you know expand. Uh, so because of that what will happen the pore water pressure uh, becomes a negative the negative pore water pressure develops because the clay tends to expand during the shear but it cannot. So uh, why it cannot because you know the no volume change is actually allowed during undrained loading. So because of that what will happen the pore water pressure which is actually uh, you know uh, develops because of the you know undrained conditions and uh, you know then the clay which is actually tending to expand. So for that condition what will happen is that the pore water pressure uh, uh, excess pore water pressure will be negative that is called negative pore water pressure actually develops. So in that case uh, what will happen uh, the stress path is uh, this is the uh, total stress path 
now sigma dash is equal to sigma minus u and then because of you know minus sign the effective stress path is actually on the right hand side you can see that the effective stress path so this is the effective stress path for you know for war consolidated clay and this is you know the total stress path for the war consolidated so you can see that the origin of this stress path is from k0 greater than 1 line here. So now after having discussed about the stress paths in PQ space now let us look into you know how this stress paths in PQ space can be linked with more Coulomb failure criteria and then subsequently how we can actually define a failure criterion for soils. So we have already discussed about the Bohr circles and we said that the Bohr stress circle indicates the stress state in a given element and we can also determine at the stresses at failure. So these examples we have already looked into it in the previous lectures. Now if the load or stress in a foundation or earth slope is increased and until the deformation becomes too large then we say that the soil under the foundation or the slope has failed. Let us say that we are having a foundation when we continue to load further then there can be possibility that the soil under the foundation or when you increase the instability to the slope the slope, the slope actually attains failure. So if the load or stress in a foundation or earth slope is increased until the deformation becomes too large we say that the soil under the foundation or slope has failed. So in this case we are actually referring to the strength of the soil and which is really the maximum or ultimate stress the material can support. We can say the strength of the soil is nothing but the definition if you look into it is the maximum or ultimate stress the material can support you know is defined as the strength. You know then in the geotechnical engineering we are generally concerned with the shear strength of the soils because the most of our problems in foundations and network engineering failure results from excessive applied shear stresses. When the shear stresses you know the driving shear stresses actually dominate the shear strength of the material then the failure you know inception of the failure takes place and the failure occurs. So in geotechnical engineering we are generally concerned with the shear strength of soils because in most of our problems in foundations and network engineering the failure results from excessive applied shear stresses. So consider here in this particular slide we have a stiff footing and when it is actually subjected to you know excessive loading then there can be possibility that you know this footing undergoes a failure surface experiences a failure surface. So before attenuation of the failure surface there is a certain mobilized shear strength to counter this external loading and so this is what we call as a failure surface or a slip line and you know this is you know the mobilized shear strength but if you are having a slope which is because of the self weight when it is actually trying to you know counter this driving shear stress this tau m is nothing but the mobilized shear strength to counter the so this is also what we call a a failure surface. So here the soil grains actually soil generally you know the fails in shear the moment actually the driving shear stresses due to this strip footing loading overcomes the mobilization shear strength then the failure occurs. Similarly here also the driving shear stresses due to the self weight of the soil mass which is actually subjected to outward movement like this when it is when it is actually the Z stresses actually more than the mobilized shear strength the failure occurs and so then we say that the soils generally fail in shear and the soil grains actually slide over each other along the failure surface without any crushing of individual grains. So what will what is actually happening is that along the failure surface the soil grains actually you know slide you know over each other along the failure surface without any crushing of individual grains. So at failure the shear stresses along the failure surface that is mobilized shear strength reaches the shear strength of the material. So that means that tau m is equal to tau f. So at failure tau m is tau m actually mobilized shear strength actually equal to tau f that means that you know the failure inception takes place. So you know always for adequate stability either due to condition of example of strip footing or due to condition of a slope or embankment see the tau f and tau m has to have a certain factor of safety the factor of safety you know is actually defined as you know tau f by tau m and if it is actually having adequate 
uh, then you know it is uh, you know found to be uh, you know uh, have stable uh, conditions. So consider another example like retaining wall and uh, when the retaining wall moves away from the uh, backfill so this is actually backfill and uh, this is the a typical example of uh, a retaining wall and when it is subjected to say active condition active earth pressure conditions wall moves away from the backfill. So in that case what will happen is that uh, the failure wedge actually is uh, countered by the mobilized shear resistance along the failure surface which is actually shown here moment this is uh, you know is uh, dominated by this uh, driving shear stresses in this case only self weight is there but if it is subjected to certain external loading and they also contribute to the these driving shear stresses and then once these driving shear stresses dominate this uh, uh, mobilized shear stress then the here also the failure actually uh, occurs. So here also we say that the shear failure of uh, you know soils. Yes. So now uh, after having discussed about the importance of shear strength and, uh, uh, and uh, shear stresses which are actually caused merely due to uh, the external loadings. Now let us look into certain uh, you know stress strain relationships and failure criteria and uh, let us consider uh, typical uh, stress strain behavior of a mild steel here wherein we have sigma versus epsilon where uh, we have got uh, a, a stress strain variation of a mild steel is actually shown here and this is a point uh, where the yield stress and what we call is the proportional limit. So you can see that there is uh, a hump which is created and then the hardening takes place and then there is a some softening takes place here. So uh, where uh, the softening indicates that with increase in the uh, with increase in the strain there is a decrease in the uh, stress and uh, in the in the hardening in the sense but with increase in the strain there is a gradual increase in the strength. So from the stress strain curve of the mild steel you can see that the initial portion up to the uh, proportional limit or yield point is linearly elastic we can say that the initial portion of the plastic limit or uh, uh, initial portion of the proportional limit or yield point is linearly elastic, <coughs> elastic. and this means that the material will return to its original shape once uh, the stress is actually removed. So as long as the applied uh, stress is actually below the yield point we can say that the, the, uh, the element uh, will be under the elastic conditions. So the initial portion of the uh, you know the, um, the stress strain curve of the mild steel uh, is actually uh, in the linear elastic conditions and this means that the, uh, the material will return to original shape when uh, the stress is actually released as long as the applied stress is actually is below the yield point. Note we, uh, we need to note that uh, if even linearly elastic materials yield if sufficient uh, stress is actually applied. So you can see that some yielding of these materials uh, you know uh, at uh, higher order of stresses and at the proportional limit the material becomes plastic and uh, yields plastically. So from uh, uh, at the proportional limit what will actually happen is that the material tends to become plastic and yields plastically. So the material actually experiences a plastic failure. So this is actually yield point what we call and in this limit this point is called proportional limit and this proportional limit the material actually becomes uh, plastic and uh, yields plastically. Now let us uh, also consider uh, you know uh, we have say non, we also have non-linear uh, elastic uh, variation the stress strain variation can be non-linear. So it is possible however for a material to have a non-linear stress strain curve and still it is uh, being elastic. So note that both uh, these uh, stress strain uh, for by mild steel and non-linear elastic relationships are independent of time and if the time is variable then the material is called uh, viscoelastic. So some real materials such as soils and polymers are viscoelastic in nature. So some real materials like soils and polymers they, are, they exhibit the viscoelastic stress strain behavior, viscoelastic stress strain behavior. So you know when the time is actually is a parameter but you know in case if you look into the stress strain behavior of a mild steel and the stress strain behavior which is actually shown here they are independent of time. So in people who can say that why cannot actually we use viscoelastic theory uh, to describe the behavior of soils when we are actually saying that uh, uh, the soils actually real materials like soils exhibit the viscoelastic behavior. But uh, the limitations is that uh, the linear theory of viscoelasticity so the uh, limitation is that the limitations of the uh, you know the linear uh, theory of viscoelasticity because of that uh, 
you know we are not a, we are uh, we have some limitations in describing the behavior uh, using viscoelastic theory. So here uh, a typical uh, two examples of perfective plastic and elastoplastic conditions shown here the stress strain behavior and uh, here uh, the perfectly plastic materials are indicated and sometimes it is actually called as rigid plastic so that means that yield stress is there on the uh, y axis that is sigma axis and then uh, material is actually remains uh, you know with increase in strain uh, the strain actually the stress is actually is maintained at the yield stress. So the behavior of the real materials can be idealized basically by two relationships stress strain relationships one what we call as the perfectly plastic other one is called elastoplastic and this elastoplastic actually uh, is the more realistic uh, stress strain relationship is, uh, is uh, elastoplastic a linear region and then you know uh, for example uh, when you have got a mild steel beyond the proportion limit the particular portion can be also linearized uh, by maintaining a horizontal plateau here. So example is that elastoplastic uh, can be uh, you know described elastoplastic behavior can be idealized for a mild steel and a linear elastic up to the yield point and then becomes perfectly plastic. So beyond uh, yield point uh, it becomes actually perfectly plastic. So this is the more realistic uh, stress strain relationship in case, uh, which is actually called as elastoplastic and uh, example is that for mild steel and which actually remains up to linear elastic up to, uh, up to yield point and then thereafter it actually has uh, you know perfectly plastic uh, state. Now uh, you know we also have another typical stress strain behavior that is called uh, brittle and uh, work hardening and softening uh, conditions uh, different uh, curves are actually shown here. The curve which is on the left hand side which actually indicates for the brittle behavior variation. So at some point uh, at the point of uh, strain uh, loading uh, the material undergoes a catastrophic collapse and crushes. So this is generally can happen for cast iron or concrete or some cement stabilized soils. Uh, where uh, they have very uh, they tend to exhibit uh, you know the brittle behavior. So the brittle behavior is that the abruptly at a particular after attaining particular strain the material undergoes a sudden collapse or a uh, you know the, it actually gets crushed and uh, example is that the cast iron or concrete and lot of rocks are brittle in nature in that they exhibit very little strain as the stress actually increases. So there will be an abrupt failure and this is actually a stress strain behavior which actually is shown for a brittle condition. But here uh, what we have for sigma, uh, sigma versus epsilon and conditions like work hardening. So we can see that we have the two curves here they actually uh, has work, work hardening uh, type of uh, behavior and then, then we here we have the work softening type of curves here. So you can see that this is uh, you know typical work softening curve where with uh, increase in uh, strain there is a decrease in the stress and in this case with increase in strain there is a decrease in the uh, you know the stress you can see. So here there is actually the hardening is happening and here is actually what we say is that softening is happening. In work hardening basically material becomes so stiffer uh, because uh, they attain higher modulus as they are actually strained uh, or uh, as they are getting strained or worked out. So work hardening materials be, uh, you know become uh, stiffer uh, as they are strained or worked. Work softening materials show a decrease in the stress as they are strained beyond a peak stress. As they strain beyond a peak stress, so beyond a peak stress, what will happen is that they experience the softening condition, and with that, what will happen is that the uh, what we call the strain softening actually occurs when it is when they are strained beyond the peak stress. So we have work hardening conditions and work softening conditions. In fact, uh, you know, we in the mild steel we actually have. Uh, first is actually has hardening and then it is actually followed by a softening actually takes place. And uh, so when you link this stress strain uh, relationships and failure criteria, so the little hump in this stress strain curve for mild steel after yield in example of work hardening what we are just, just discussing the uh, many soils are also work hardening for example compacted clays and loose sands and loose sands when they are actually shared. Uh, they, are, they are actually exhibit also uh, you know the work, work hardening uh, you know when, when you have got uh, some compacted clays they also show uh, you know work hardening uh, you know sustained behavior and the sensitive clay soils and dense sands they exhibit work softening that means that after the peak stresses what will happen is that there is a strain uh, the so work softening uh, situation actually happens here. So at what point on the stress behavior can do, you, do we have failure? 
So uh, that is actually you know what we we say that in some situations if a material is tested to its yield point, then uh, the strains or deflections are so large that all the practical purposes the material has actually failed. So if uh, some situations uh, if a material is actually stressed uh, to its uh, yield point, uh, then the we say that the strains or deflections uh, are so large that uh, all practical purposes the material actually has failed. And this means that the material cannot satisfactorily continue to carry the applied loads and the stress set failure is often very arbitrary especially for non-linear materials. So the stress set failure is actually very arbitrary we take it for some non-linear materials we take a certain strain. So it means that material cannot satisfactorily continue to carry the applied loads and the stress set failure is often very arbitrary especially for non-linear materials. So in this you know we what we are trying to see is that in some situation practical situation if a material is actually stressed to its yield point the strains or deflections are so large that all practical purposes the material actually attains the failure condition. So with these materials generally we usually define some the materials which are actually undergoing some hardening define some failure condition at some arbitrary percentage of strain like 10 percent or 15 percent or 20 percent strain or at a strain or deformation at which the function of the structure might be impaired. So from the serviceability point of view and we can see and we can actually also define the strength of the material. So it is the maximum or yield stress or the stress at some strain which we have defined as the failure. So it is depends upon that what arbitrarily the strain actually has been selected. Uh, and uh, there are many ways of defining the failure in materials or put another way there are many uh, failure criteria and uh, most of the criteria basically they do not work for soils. So most common uh, failure criterion uh, what we say is that uh, they apply to the stresses in soils is the Mohr Coulomb uh, failure criterion uh, where uh, you know one of the uh, you know the traditional uh, uh, soil failure criterion and this is the only failure criterion uh, in which actually the stresses at failure can be determined along the failure plane. The stresses at failure can be determined along the failure plane. So when the when the when the element or a soil mass is actually subjected to the shear stresses which are actually more than the strength of the material, then the failure is actually attains. And what we are actually saying is that there are many ways of defining this failure in materials. Uh, but uh, that means that uh, set of the criteria are there, but most of the criteria basically they fail for soils and one of the common uh, criteria uh, which we are actually going to discuss is the Mohr Coulomb failure criteria. And this was actually uh, you know uh, introduced by first by the Coulomb 19, uh, 1736 to 1806 and well known from his studies in friction and electrostatic attraction and repulsion. And because of the, the need for the design of retaining walls, the Coulomb actually has postulated and defined the, the shear strength and then it was used successfully for after noting this, noticing the several failures of the walls, you know the Coulomb actually has formulated the, the, the shear strength and also recognized that there are two different types of you know uh, inherent uh, properties of the soil one is actually um, you know the stress dependent one other one is stress independent one and with that uh, you know the uh, Coulomb actually has formulated uh, you know and defined the shear, uh, shear strength. And uh, uh, Christian Otto Mohr during uh, 1835 to 1918 uh, hypothesized actually uh, a criterion uh, of failure for real materials in which he stated that material fail when the shear stress on the failure plane at failure reaches some unique function of normal stress on that plane. So uh, Mohr actually has opposed that a, a, a hypothesis actually given uh, in which a set of criterion is that failure of the real material occurs in which he stated that material fail when the shear stress on the failure plane uh, at failure reaches some unique function of the normal stress. So tau f f, f tau is nothing but the shear stress and sigma is nothing but the normal stress. The first subscript f indicates that you know refers to the plane on which the stress acts, the plane on which the stress acts, and f is nothing but at that is that is in this case a failure plane, 
and the second F indicates that uh, at failure. So this is nothing but the shear stress at failure along failure plane, normal stress at failure along failure plane. So um, uh, Moore actually has given a relationship that tau FF is equal to function of uh, sigma FF and where this is actually is uh, you know uh, given and then uh, this was actually combined with the Coulomb uh, criterion wherein uh, the Coulomb actually said that uh, this is what actually the tau versus sigma space uh, where according to Moore hypothesis that tau FS is equal to function of sigma FF and uh, here it is nothing but uh, the tau FF is nothing but the shear stress along the failure plane at failure and uh, sigma FF is nothing but the normal stress at failure uh, at failure. And this uh, can be achieved because at, at uh, an element at failure uh, when the with the principal stresses that caused the failure the resulting normal and shear stresses uh, on the failure plane. So we will assume that the failure plane exists which is not a bad exemption for soils or rocks or many other materials. Uh, basically we know that uh, the principal stresses at failure we can draw a more circle uh, and to represent the state of stress for this particular element. We also discussed it that by knowing the uh, principal stresses we can draw the more circles. So when we have got different uh, sample stresses tested at different principal stresses we can actually draw the series of uh, more circles. So in uh, this particular uh, lecture we introduced ourselves to uh, discuss it about the stress paths and we continued our discussion for OC clays and normally consolidated clays and thereafter we actually have tried to understand the stress strain relationships and different uh, stress states with uh, conditions like rigid plastic, viscoplastic and perfectly plastic and elastoplastic stress strain behaviors and thereafter we introduced ourselves to you know the more coulomb failure criterion so we'll continue further in this direction